Hey guys, it's Josh here. Welcome to interview number nine, the final interview for my series, Scaling Your Divi Web Design Business. In this interview, I chat with Sarah Oates of Indoor Web Studios. She's based down under in Australia, and we go into some great detail about where she's come from as a freelance website designer to now she's just starting to take that first step. Now she has a subcontractor, and she's really working on things to take it to that next level. And I think this talk is going to be especially beneficial for those of you who are in a similar situation that Sarah and I are in to where maybe you're just a one man shop or you have a really small team. You're just wanting to take that first step. I get it. It can be really intimidating with some of these other interviews where people are running, you know, teams of 15, 20 to, to 30 people. Whereas this interview talks about on a smaller scale how to start growing your Divi website design business. We talk about tools, project management software, and a lot of systems that she has in place which has helped her get to this point to where she's ready to take to the next level. So I can't wait to hear how this helps you out. And I was really hoping to see a kangaroo hop in the background. She says sometimes that happens, but unfortunately, I'm sorry, we didn't go long enough to see a kangaroo hop in the background. But maybe the next one. So enjoy this interview. Let me know how it helps you out. Sarah, thanks so much for taking some time and chatting with us today. No worries. Good to be here. So why don't you just, before we get going into kind of um, some ideas about, you know, where you're at with scaling and everything, why don't you tell us a little bit about Indoor Web Studios, what you do, and kind of where you're at right now. Um, okay. So uh, Indoor Web Studios is my business that I started around about four years ago now. Um so it's a web design business essentially, but I have started to offer some graphic design services as well. Um, but essentially, it's a web design business for small to medium businesses. Most of my clients are in Australia, but not all of them. Um, some of them have come through Elegant Themes, and so it's a little bit more international. But by the most part, it's Australian clients. Um, and mostly, I love working with the smaller businesses who understand that a website is going to make a really big difference to their business, but they're not ginormous. So they've got money, they're willing to put into it, but at the same time, they're not some um, big scale business. I've done a few of those now, um, but I still prefer the smaller guys, I think. Um, so yeah, that's my business and um, it's mostly just been me for the most part. I started the business by working. So I was working during the day full time or part time mm -hmm. and looking after my son at home and then also at night time I was running Endure. So I would kind of get my kids to bed at seven o'clock at night and then I would work from like eight until midnight most nights. And that was kind of how I started my business, just doing the two things at once. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Awesome. So and you so right now you're you're kind of just taking that next step, right? You've got a subcontractor that you're just starting to hire some work out to. Do you want to just kind of talk about what that looks like for you? I mean, so you're, yeah. you're just kind of taking that next step right now, right? Yeah. So for the last year, I've been debating about whether or not I need to scale up and whether I need to go to the next phase because I haven't looked for work for the last year, probably the last year and a half. I haven't looked intentionally for any work. I've just continually had inquiries come and then been able to say to them, okay, well, I'm two months booked out. And so then I book someone in for two months time. So I've felt very fortunate in that way. Um, but I think it's also meant that I've got to this scaling point where I don't have any more time. Like I can't yeah. actually take on any more work than what I'm doing at the moment. But in order for my family to function, <laughs> we probably need a bit more money <laughs> than yeah. what I'm bringing into our family. And yeah. so I need to work out how to move it forward. But I was really scared. Like I was really afraid to take the plunge to hire someone because it's one thing to risk for my myself and my family. Like I've got to the point where I can say to my family, I will bring in this amount of income at the start of the month every month. And I feel confident that I can do that. But that's taken three or four years to build up to the point where right. I know I'm going to have that bit of money at the start of every month. So to be able to say I can also have that bit of money for somebody else, that's like I can't guarantee I've got that much work just yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've been debating around do I do it, don't I do it, how do I do it, do I – um, I, there's a local, um, another Divi girl here in Canberra and I really want to hire her but mm. I just don't have enough work and so she would be a developer type person like a front end builder and I still have that in my sights. I still want to go there but I don't have enough work and so 
um, I started getting a few graphic design inquiries and I realized that maybe that would be a better way to go. And okay. so I had a few friends who I trained graphic designers who their kids have started school and they were at home. And so they were trying to work out, well, what should they do with their time? How do they manage their work? And so I started outsourcing some logos um, and some print work to them. And gotcha. Um, then one of them got another job and so I've just been left with one and she, I put it out to her, would you be interested in learning how to design websites because you're great at print work, would you be interested in migrating over to websites and she was very tentative and eventually she said yes and she's fabulous and so now my business is at the point where someone asks for a website, I then ask Sophie, is she interested in doing the work? Um, I tell her how much of a budget I have for the design part of that and how many hours and then she says yes or no and gotcha. to this point she's been able to take everything on um, but basically I'm moving to the point where she designs the websites and then I build the websites. Oh, okay. And, yeah. So she's doing and more so, than just graphic design as far as logos and stuff. She's yeah. actually helping out on yeah. the design in of, yeah. of what the website design. So, yeah. To this point, I've just got her to do a homepage and maybe a subpage mm -hmm. design. Um, and obviously, I'm very capable to do that because I've done it the whole way. But design definitely feels like my – it's not the part I love as much. Okay. It's always the part I procrastinate over. Yeah. It's the part where my house gets really clean <laughs> because I need to design. And I love it. And in the end, the client loves it. And it's not that I'm not good at it, but I love the building part of it. Um, yeah. That's the part that I thrive in. And I realized – that it was silly for me to be holding on so tightly to something that then I would procrastinate against and I was fighting against it yep. and I didn't have enough time anyway and she's fabulous and we just tested it on a one page and she did a fabulous job and I felt really confident and so now I've started to hand more and more awesome. and my hope is over time that we will have enough that then I could also get a front end person at the same kind of capacity where it's not that I'm employing them full time but I'm employing them per job if they've got the time. If they don't have the time, then, you know, that's going to be harder for me. Yeah. Or if they suddenly get a job mm -hmm. somewhere else, that's harder for me. So I don't have security in it, but the security is in the fact that I only have to pay out of money that I know I'm going to receive. So I don't have to know I'm going to have like a certain amount of money every month to give them. Mm -hmm. I can say I'm going to be getting this much for this job and I can allocate this portion of it to that person. And um, that's that's been one of the main questions I've asked everybody is, do you have money saved up or do you just allocate that into the expenses of the project? So it sounds like for you, it's more of, you're looking at what's projected, right? If you have three websites on board, it's like, okay, you know, if these are two grand a pop or three grand a pop, you can allocate, you know, a certain amount of money for the design in. Um, yeah. So that, that kind of sounds like what you're doing, right? Yeah. You're just kind of. And I already that. knew how much I, how much time I would spend on the job, and okay. so basically, I've worked out an hourly rate with her, and I've worked out this is how much time I would spend on the design. This is what I'm willing to spend, and so we're kind of trying to find a middle ground in between that of saying, well, I would have spent ten hours on this, so right. you've got up to ten hours worth of budget, <laughs> um, and so because she's still learning how websites work that's obviously going to take her longer at the moment mm -hmm. but in the long term it will take her less time right yep. right and that's one thing that everyone has said so far that i've interviewed is that that first initial phase it's going to take a little bit longer to have yeah. a little patience and to almost you know on a couple of projects you might break even or you might even spend a little bit of money at first yeah. but you know as long as they work out and it's a good fit and they continue to do work then yeah it can really pay off in the long run and it's interesting you were talking about freeing yourself up to do what you do best and after yeah. all of what I've researched, so, so you're my last interview here. I've researched quite a few others, you know, like I said before we went live, some that are in our situation, because you and I are actually very mirrored in a lot of ways. We, I have a business that I still do pretty much all the web design, but I'm hiring out graphic design and logos and stuff nice. like that. So very yeah. similar. And I'm kind of in that position where, and I'm hesitant to say this live, but I'm going <laughs> to start hiring as well, um, not yeah. full time or part time, but as needed. So. Yeah. But it's all about that freedom. It's, it's a few things. You know, some people just want to build a big agency and just want to scale. And that's fine. Yeah. But it's also fine if you just want to do your own thing and have your family and then free yourself up to either have more time, have more money or do what you do best. And that's kind of what it is for me, too, is like I I'm good at support. I'm good at a lot of the back end stuff. But 
I just don't enjoy that as much. Like I would much rather be doing this kind of thing. Now that I'm kind of stepping into the mindset of the CEO, the president of the company, I'm really trying to get myself out of the technician seat and being the leader of the company. And so for me, it's like, I just don't want to do some of those menial tasks that I know are just as invaluable. They're, They're just as important. But it's taken me away from the big picture stuff. So for you, I just wanted to kind of back you up on that. It's like, it's a risk, but I think having that yeah. freedom is going to be such a good reward for, for yourself with the business. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Like already um, this month I'm spending down the coast. So it's school holidays at the moment for us in Australia. So our kids have like six to eight weeks off school. Um, and for the last three or four years, I've still had to consistently work through school Mm. holidays and it's a nightmare. Like it's really, really hard to be working while my kids are at home and they hate it. Um, But this month I've taken basically the whole month off. I haven't taken on any client work other than maintenance stuff. Mm. And so every afternoon I'll sit down at the computer for maybe an hour or two hours, but that's it um, for the whole month of January. And that's partly due to the business growing to the point it was partly due to planning towards the end end of the year but it was partly due to the fact that Sophie was doing some of the design which meant that I could step away from that and um, be doing some other work in the build up so I knew I had enough money to not have to do a new job in January to pull off the money. Awesome awesome now do you have how, how involved is she I mean for your for from an email's perspective, are you getting mm-hmm. all the emails and just you know zipping things over to her, or is she actually like plugged in with your email and helping out like that, or are you more or less just kind of filtering off things to her? I'm just filtering off at this point. Um, it's dependent on the job, so we're still kind of feeling our way to what works for both of us at the moment. So. Um, for some of the graphic design jobs that she's done where it's just print based, it's not web, I'm not actually doing anything. The first one, everything filtered through me because the client was a tricky client. Mm. And so I had to allow a lot of extra time for them to tell me stuff, me to tell her stuff, her to tell me, me, you know, it was going back. You're the middleman in between all that. Yeah, which was horrible, um, but it needed to be that way for that particular client. Um, The next client that we've done a logo for, um, I've said to both of them, uh, like I've introduced them and I've said, Sophie's going to be doing the, the design. You can speak straight to Sophie, just CC me into everything. And so I'm kind of staying in the loop. And, you know, if the client doesn't respond, then I'll speak up and say, hey, just wondering, yeah. we haven't heard from you. So you like being the backup. So you're, you're um, I'm always of, the one who talks the act- money. Yeah, I got you. And in, in <laughs> yeah. that case, you're kind of the creative director and kind of project manager too, right? To where you're yeah. sneaking in there when needed. So I've had to work out with her an hourly rate that, so it's um, basically 80%. I mean, it should probably be much, much lower than that to be affordable, but she's a really good graphic designer and she deserves to be paid a decent amount of money. So um, basically, I just chop that 20% off the top to manage things. Um, I don't know if that's effective long term, but at the moment, I'm going to have to increase my prices to be able to do it any other way unless I got someone overseas and I don't want to. I want to have someone local. My end goal, I would love to have like a little agency here in Canberra of like all chicks. I think it would be amazing. (laughs) So like that's kind of like the end goal, but you know, that's years away. So well, I know I need to pay bigger money for local people. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a great mindset, honestly, Sarah, because you understand that value. And I don't know anybody who has a successful team where they're just trying to find the absolute cheapest service. And then also, maybe this will lead into a different question with, with her, but if you look for the lowest cost to be able to hire something out, it's generally not going to go well because you're going to either get crap no. work or they're going to feel like they're getting nickel and dimed. I mean, in this case, did you ask her for her hourly rate or did you more or less just say, here's you know about how much I could pay you per hour? How'd you go about that? It was really tricky. So we're friends and we've been friends for a long time. So I was really hesitant because we are friends and I knew that if it went really badly, it could be really bad yeah. because we have this small group of like, I don't know, eight friends and she's one of them and I'm one of them. Like, you know, if that went really sour then that's part of our core group that could be a really big problem. So I was very hesitant and I was very hesitant to talk money with her. Um, But we have been talking for years because she's a graphic designer and as soon as she started having kids, she was working freelance as a graphic designer and we had talked hourly rates. So I knew her hourly rate purely because we had talked about other people and me slowly increasing my hourly rate and 
Um, so I kind of knew her hourly rate and I had been telling her she should be charging more. So it made it tricky then when I was coming <laughs> to her and saying, I want you to do more for me, but I can't pay that more <laughs> that I told okay. you you should be asking for. Um, so I said to her, you know, this is what I can pay. I can offer you this much. Um, I know it's not as much as I was suggesting that you should have, but at the moment that's, I need to have some money on top of it. And I was really honest with what I charged the client as well. So I said, you know, like, um, I'm happy to pay you this much and then I'm going to charge the client this much. That just gives me 20% to be able to manage stuff at the moment. This is all I can do, but if I get to up my rates at some point, I would plan to up your rates also. So what you paid her initially was at least more or equal to her, her hourly weight, right? Yeah, def- yeah, it was it was a good rate. Okay. I just was telling her she should be charging more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I mean, for her, I mean, she's got regular work. She's not looking for it. She doesn't have a lot of liability because it's going through my business. Mm-hmm. So although she's, the designer, she could just leave at any point. So I think in some ways that warrants her receiving less money um, just purely because she doesn't have to do any of the back work to the business. So I think as a freelancer, if you're the one who's doing all the work, that you need to build in money to be doing that work as well, whereas she's just actually physically doing the graphic design work, Mm -hmm. no admin. Um, And so I think that warrants her receiving a little bit less for us to be able to make the business. Yeah, and especially for designers, whether it's a graphic designer or a web designer, I mean, a lot of those folks don't enjoy the sales aspect. So for her, I would imagine, I I don't know her skill set or what her ideal work is, but if she just likes doing the design, then that's awesome. You get to work from home or a coffee shop or wherever you want. And then if you're working with a friend and it sounds like you guys have a good working relationship as well as a friendship, which is obviously, you know, you kind of, you kind of built that foundation there. I mean, that's awesome. It's a win-win I would imagine. And uh, it keeps on playing out well. I'm excited to see like where you're going to be at next year this time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it will be really interesting to see. And we did it very slowly. So we both kind of hesitantly went in, we said, let's just try it for one job. And so it was one graphic design job we both kind of said, let's just see how it goes. And then we did one more graphic design job. And the same thing came when I said, how about we just try one website? Like, you know, do you want to just try one? And then that went okay. So we've just kind of slowly gone in. We don't have any contracts, which we probably should. I've got a few emails that state kind of the pay and those kind of okay. things. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, we don't have any formal contracts. Well, but I- according to Australia law, we, I don't, Unless I employ her, she can kind of do whatever she wants. Like okay. if she just wants to disappear, she can just disappear. If she wants to subcontract the work that I give her, she can do that. Mm-hmm. I would hope that she wouldn't do that right, because right. I have chosen her because I feel like she can represent my brand correctly. She could subcontract it to Fivers, like yeah. or to whatever well, that That happened to me. I was working leave. Yeah. I worked on a project last year and yeah, a guy I knew from the UK, I was working with him. And I had no idea he was subcontracting that work to a guy in Poland yeah. or something. I was like, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So according to Australian law, if I don't want her to have the ability to do that, um, and also she can do it however she wants. So she can use whatever software she wants. She can, you know, like she has a little bit more freedom to do it in her way. Whereas if I want to have complete control and say it needs to be done this particular way, you can't give the work to anybody else, gotcha. then I need to employ her. And then also I need to start paying her superannuation, which I don't know if you guys do that there. Do you have superannuation? No, it's no. like a savings for when you retire. Oh, it's just it's called it's called something differently than okay. uh, yeah, but yeah, similar to where I mean, you're talking about you know if she's coming in on part time, you're talking about benefits and and stuff yeah. like that, and, and we, we don't do benefits, but we have to pay that the super gotcha. that we call it here. So um, there are a lot of it's a big jump, but my protection is a lot bigger if I choose to employ her. So at some point, okay. I may need to make that decision because obviously I'm training her in web design and I don't just want her to disappear and I don't think she would because she's my friend but at the same time if I if I say take on someone else who's going to do front-end developer work well that risk is definitely going to be there that someone could come on and then they could just disappear because I have no holding on them yeah um I think that's 
the well, risk one of, of the, where I am. Well, yeah, one of the apprehensions I have, just kind of echo what you're talking about there, is it's like, well, what if I invest a lot of time in somebody and they get in this position okay. and they free me up to do what I want to do, but then if they leave or something happens, yeah. then I'm scrambling to replace them or I need to yeah. take time back into that or I can really get behind on projects. But it is. It's just one of those risks that you have to deal with. Yeah. And I know... This series has helped me. I can't wait for you to to hear some of the other interviews and, yeah, and I'd love to. the full series will of course be on the Elegant Themes blog because I'm picking pieces from you know the best um, really the the best lessons learned and, and everything. But yeah. one thing I've learned from all this so far is that you want to try to systematize things as much as possible. So I'm going to do like a whole internal thing on my In Transit Studios website about you know who we are, why we do what we do. I'm going to try to do as many tutorials. That way somebody could essentially yeah, just I- go through and just really free me up. Aside, I mean, yeah. of course, there's inevitably there's going to be training and things like that. But shoot, if you do something multiple times, there's no reason not to make it a template yeah. or a, yeah. a tutorial video or something like that. So that may be something you might consider too is, you know, if you find yourself doing multiple things or you want to get somebody else plugged in to try to make it kind of a standardized process, maybe have it on the back end of your site and, that way somebody, you know, God forbid something happened, at least somebody could jump in, yeah. you know, save you some time. That's at least that's one thing I'm going to try to do while I am going to do moving forward here. Yeah, I think uh, definitely with particularly with front end developing type stuff with Divi, I think that that will be essential. It'd be really interesting if I lost Sophie as a graphic designer, because I feel like a lot of that isn't about system. A lot of that is about knowledge of design Mm -hmm. and then picking the right person who has the right style to fit your brand um so i think that's like a whole different kettle of fish but i think certainly for front-end developing um it's very much system and it makes a lot of sense and even just the fact that i would love to take on someone to do some of my maintenance work like someone to kind of take the maintenance emails and then just deal with the things but at the moment if they got an email to deal with the things, most of the things are to do with some custom plugin that I used for a website. And then right. I can't just hand that over to someone else because they didn't build it. And so then all of a sudden I'm like, well, crap, like I can't just, I can't just get someone to yeah. do it. I have to right. do it because I know how it got installed and what yeah. happened with it. And yeah. um, so I think maintenance is an interesting one, but certainly systems could help with that. Yeah. From the web design standpoint, you hit the nail on the head. It's like, we all have our own way of doing things. There's no yeah. common way to build a website. I mean, we no. use Divi. Especially not in Divi. Yeah. Yeah. We well, you do. can put the CSS in mm-hmm. about 500 different places. Right. right. I know. So I, that alone is going to be a problem. Yep. Yeah, it's just, yeah, and that makes it really difficult to be able to have somebody jump on a project. I know I'm doing some business coaching right now, and it's been a great program. It's really helped me kind of rewire my mindset. But one of the things that one of the people there told me was like, "Well, can't you just get like a you know like a fresh college student who you know who's just out of college and can build a website for cheaper?" I'm like, "It isn't. It's not that simple with web <laughs> yeah. design because I." First of all, the work, the quality might not be there, which inevitably, if you're going to hire out to somebody who's learning, you got to give them room to grow. I, yeah. I've, I've said in, in quite a few interviews that I'm kind of looking for Josh like three years ago is who I'd like yeah. to find. Somebody who's, you know, yeah. I can afford to be able to hire, but they're willing to grow and they'll just dive in and, and go for it. But yeah. yeah, inevitably, it's just not that easy to, to be able right. to say, hey, just build this website. You can learn Divi. It's just it's a completely... Yeah, you kind of have to train people to do things your way. And I, I, one of the interviews I had was with Gino. And one thing that really helped him, I thought was interesting that I think applies to us is he kind of guided a Jerry who works for him now in exactly the way he builds websites. Yeah, And I'm kind of working on that too, which is kind of a, a side reason that I'm doing my tutorials with my joshhall.co stuff is I want to have a library. That way when I have, I'm building websites and I have some people working on it, if they say, hey, how did you put a button in the menu? And I can say, well, just follow yeah. my tutorial. And there you go. <laughs> so there's Full a lot of different systems. Yeah, 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 right. There's a lot of different systems there that I think can help with that. But nonetheless, that is the one of the biggest struggles, I think, with web design. And I know I got – actually, when I was introduced to Divi, I subcontracted for a company here in Columbus. And their web design team was just – it was a mess because – Every yeah. system was different. Every designer did it differently. There was no continuity between anything, and it was a real struggle. Um, don't mean to be a downer on all that, but it just it makes <laughs> this kind of series more and more important yeah. to get those systems yeah. in place and 
you know, free your free your time up to be able to to have somebody step in there. But I think yeah. that's great, Sarah. I mean, you're in a really good spot. I think it's cool from what I know about you with having built the business and then now you're taking that next step. Um, when you started Endure, did you ever think it would get to this point or was it just kind of something you were doing as a hobby on the side? Honestly, I think I was a bit blind going in. Like, I, I'm not really sure if I knew. I, I tend to be a cup half full type person. I'm a bit of an enthusiastic jump in kind of person. So I knew that I wanted to learn how to do websites and then I felt like no one would hire me. Like I felt like I didn't have a uni degree. I had just learned at home. I used lynda.com. I did it while my son was like in his first year when I was on maternity leave. So I just spent time then doing lynda.com. So I did all their courses on HTML and CSS and then when I went to go build a website for someone, I realized they wanted to be able to update it. So then I realized I had to do WordPress. So I kind of like stumbled my way into WordPress through HTML. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, okay, I've got to do these WordPress websites. So then I started doing that. And then I knew I had to keep doing my job. So at some point I wanted to do websites, but I felt like no one would hire me. Like I think I would have been quite happy just to get a job at a web agency but I felt like I didn't have the full skill set. So I felt like I had no choice but to do my own business, which mm. I'm not sure whether that's true or not. Um, and then at some point I just got sick of, I just couldn't manage like doing the job and doing night work. And so I just took the leap into starting my own business, which financially on reflection was a really stupid move. And it made that first year really, really, really hard. <laughs> but I got there and it was fine and we survived. Um, but so I think I just kind of kept stumbling across to the next thing. I had this vague dream in my mind, oh, wouldn't it be cool to like have an agency? But at the same time, the scary factor has probably prevented me from fully going there. And there are definitely moments where I go, well, could I just keep it small? Like, could it just be me at my capacity? And that's just what it is. And over time, I'm more skilled, so I'm faster, so I sli earn slightly more money, I can mm -hmm. increase my rates. Could I just keep it small? And I think I still have been in and around that for the whole last year of do I go agency, do I stay small, do I hire to the Philippines and have like a virtual assistant who also helps me build websites yeah. or, and train them up, which I looked into the avenue of. Um, and it just felt like such a big financial risk, even that the amount of money you had to invest to have one employee yes. was yeah. more than what I had because I wanted to go through a system that was a bit more managed. Um, and then when Sophie came along, it just it just fit and it, it was much more manageable. And so then I suddenly realized, I think this is the avenue for me. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I've never really, <laughs> I probably should plan more. I probably should have a business plan. I don't, um, I'm kind of playing it by ear and just trying to make the smartest decision for our family. That's great um, though. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And like I said, I mean, there's no right or not everyone needs to have a big agency with, with 20 or 30 people, you yeah. know, and I've kind of felt, it's intimidating because some of the people in the Divi community are so like, they're just so <laughs> on it where I'm like, it's I just flying. feel like, yeah, I just feel like I'm just lagging behind and I'm like, you know, because I, I'm just like you, Sarah, I've stumbled into yeah. every little thing. Now that's turned out to be a good thing in a lot of ways because when you stumble into something, you often find a lot of problems and then you can make solutions. Like my security and maintenance plan, which is currently paying our mortgage, was a solution to the problem of my websites getting hacked and yeah, sites running nice. slow and stuff like that. And and honestly, to back you up, I don't know what everyone's mindset is on this, but I'm not a college guy. I did two years of community college when I started getting into web design, but the majority of what I know is all self-taught. And yeah. I have subcontracted to some college guys. And let me tell you, they are just, <laughs> I, I'm not going to speak for everyone. I don't want to overgeneralize, but college education web like going into web design it's just so slow i remember one guy i was talking yeah. to i showed him one of the sites i was designing and he was like so what do you, you would that take you like four or six weeks and i'm like try four or six days like whatever you think <laughs> like you need to completely just blow up whatever you think you know the, the quote yeah. i like to go by what the whole college thing is that the standard pace is for chumps and honestly in web design things move so <laughs> quick if you get caught with those slow programs and stuff, because in any kind of academia, you've got the really high skilled fast learners, but you've also got the laggers and it's all yeah. kind of catered right in the middle, which goes back to the standard paces for chumps. So that's kind of my biggest encouragement in that is like, 
you know, even for people who are in the college education and stuff like that, like that's great, but just know the real world moves so much faster. But yeah. I love it. I think that's very freeing. And I, I just, I love it because you get, so you can get bored if you do the same thing over and over and you, the same routines. And I don't know, the web design industry changes so much that it keeps us on, a to, uh, on our toes. I mean, it has its struggles, but uh, that's just kind of my input on that. You know, yeah. and, it, and it makes it hard sometimes to subcontract too, in that case, to where like I would love to be able to take some kids out of college and get them set up. But mm. yeah, they got to be ready to move for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Now, so this is great, Sarah. So you've given us kind of a backstory story of, you know, how the business started and how you got to this point to where, again, you know, it was just kind of something you did. You weren't sure where it was going to go. And right now it's probably yeah. still fuzzy. And I know for me, it's fuzzy. I'm not sure, like, do I want to yeah. just have a couple people or do I think I could make it something bigger that could really go to that next level that could help a lot more people as well? I mean, that's that's one of the big things, too, that I'm trying to remember is, like myself three years ago would have killed for an opportunity to kind of like shadow somebody and yeah. and to be able to work, you know, if, if it's somebody who's in their early twenties, who's a good web designer, then shoot, if they're getting a retainer or, you know, can yeah. work at a coffee shop rather than doing manual labor somewhere or something, that's a great yeah. opportunity. Um, yeah. So talk a little bit about how you guys manage your communication. You know, when you got her on board, are you guys doing email are you using like Slack or anything like that? Like how are you centralizing communication now kind of working with somebody else? Well, it's <laughs> a good question. Um, I was using Asana um, and more and more I'm finding other people find Asana challenging and it makes it really tricky because I like it, but that doesn't mean everybody else likes it. Mm. And um, a few people I've tried to bring into Asana have really struggled with it. And then recently, an app came along called Plutio. Um, so Plutio is a similar thing to Asana, but a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit more user-friendly, and it also has this really nice um, client functionality. So okay. you can invite the client into a project, and they only see certain parts of it, mm -hmm. um, and they can make comments in it. And so I, I'm still – it's a very new um, – software and so I'm still hesitant about like fully yeah. inviting clients in and going oh my gosh it just doesn't work or whatever yeah. um, but so far it's going really well so we communicate mostly in Plutio sometimes I'll text her if it's something that's urgent um, or sometimes I'll email if it you know like I'll see, see her into emails kind of thing um, or if someone sent me something and then I might forward that email to her I probably should get better at putting that into Plutio somehow but at the moment basically we do it all in Plutio so gotcha. there's like there's a project that I'll invite her into then there's a main conversation area and then we can have conversations within particular tasks that I've assigned to her gotcha yeah and I know of course you know I use Basecamp and it's similar there to where you have you yeah. can set up like a team thread and then the client view um, there's a new one called monday.com I've heard that's good too <laughs> actually I think it was Daniel with Superfly who I talked to as well, and that's what they're using now. It actually looked pretty yeah, cool because yeah. it's kind of a mix of a project manager and task manager. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah there's, there's quite a few tools out there. I know Asana and Basecamp are definitely the two most popular, but yeah. it does. It's tricky. And even clients, like I still cannot get clients off of email, barely. You know, Every yeah. once in a while, if I have a savvy client, they'll be cool with Basecamp, and then they end up liking it. But most of my clients just don't get yeah. off of email. So I've tried all of them with clients, like, and I looked into another one called Red Booth, but it was really expensive, mm. and um, but yeah, and oh, and what's the board one? So I brought people into the, all of those ones, mm. and it's never been very successful. Like I think in some ways, clients just don't work with it, and I've just realised it's just not worth pushing the clients. Like you're only with them for a certain amount of time. I'd like to move um, maintenance tickets to somewhere else, whether it's like through a proper ticketing system yeah. or through a form system, just with Gravity Forms, or um, just making an email address that is just for support and yeah. then I can invite other people but, into that process. Yeah, because I've thought about doing that too. I almost thought about doing like Help Scout or something just for, mm -hmm. for support for my mate and stuff, which yeah. generally it's not too bad. I might get a few a week for, and I, when I say yeah. support, I mean also updates for people who are on my plan and they say, hey, we yeah. want to you know, do something because I have inclu that included as well. But yeah, yeah, that's important too. And I, I think it's different with you and I right now because – with with client communication when it comes to like task management and then team communication since we're not hiring out web design stuff as much yeah i don't think we have yeah. to do the task as much because if you have somebody do a logo well 
unless there's a certain way you want that logo formatted yeah, and saved. Yeah, they can do it they their can, own yeah, way. Yeah, they can do it their own way. Yeah, so I yeah. think, I, I know for me, I'm trying to get all that nailed down, even if it's just me, even if I just yeah. give myself a task manager. That way, when I do start to hand that off, I don't have yeah. to create a whole new system and, and blow a bunch yeah. of time to, to do well, that. Well, I'm getting Sophie to do that for me. So I've asked her in Plutio to make up the subtasks for like a, a logo or for a brochure so that she can, like it's mostly so I can see the progress so I know mm. where it's up to. But then it also shows me what are the official steps because she's worked in agencies. So she knows like, you know, all the steps that are supposed to happen. I've just made it up myself as I've gone. Like I've done sure. logos before, but... I've just kind of fudged it, whereas yeah, she yeah. knows the proper steps. So I'm just getting her to do that. Oh, so okay. it's something you can get your employee to do also. Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah. And that's, really- that's one thing that's been common too, is like you can learn from people and as, as they grow, you know, you can learn a lot. I know you, I've experienced that as well. Um, the gal who I have subcontracting for me right now for some print stuff, she saved her files differently. And I didn't even know you could do that in Illustrator. I'm like, wait, you can have like the way you did those artboards and save them as PDFs and JPEGs at the same yeah. time. I didn't know you could do that. So yeah, yeah it's definitely, <laughs> I've kind of thought about that too. Like just opening that, that space up to say, you know, if somebody comes in, you give them some empowerment, you give them some freedom, give them some room to grow more importantly. And who knows yeah. what they'll show you. You know, you might learn a lot in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And I, one thing I, I've really thought about this as well when it comes to the kind of the mindset of, of hiring somebody is that giving them that space to grow and that room, for that freedom, which it sounds like for you and Sophie, like for her, she could do her own thing as well, along with working with you. Like even if she learns some stuff about Divi and website design, she wants to get into that. There's no, you know, as long as she got your work done on time and it was a good working relationship, then there's no reason she can't use those same tools and processes to, to do her own thing. Yeah. And I'm kind of thinking that too, like, if some of my subcontractors want to learn from me and make money on the side, uh, apart from what they're doing for me, cool. Like that's awesome. Yeah. As long as yeah. you know, as long as the the work I'm hiring off is is getting done on time and is, is there, then I think there's just a lot more pros than than we think when it comes to subcontracting and now scaling a business. I'm kind of finding that out. Like, of course, there's the fear, yeah. there's the risk, and all that, but there's a lot of freedoms with it too. Now, speaking of yeah. risk and fear and stuff like that. Now, so you're, I mean, it's a little bit different. Everyone's situation is different. The indoor is not your guys' main income, right, as a family, or is it kind of getting up to that point? Uh, no, well, my husband's income is our main income mm-hmm. for the family. He is in IT, so he does okay. And over time, he has built up his income, which is great. Yeah. Um, so that's probably our main income. And then I bring about half of what he brings in. Gotcha. So I'm about a third of our family income. Gotcha. Yeah. And I know yep. it just looks different for everybody. Like for me, I, my wife works with the company now. Like this is our, this is it. We're from yeah. just low middle class families. Like there, yeah. we've had, we've had some lean months where, you know, we were yeah. late on a couple stuff and we've had like last year, we had a really, really good year. Fortunate to do that. And yeah, it just, it's one of those risks when you're in your own business. But like we were talking about earlier, you're kind of taking on a little more risk in hopes yeah. that it'll kind of average out and, and, you know, financially, but I've just tried to make goals for myself the whole way. So from when I started, like I had like a goal of every month, I would try and make a certain amount through the business. Basically, I only ever get maybe 40 to 50 percent of what the business makes. So because a business needs money to run and, you know, bits and pieces or I might need a new laptop at some point or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so our family only gets about 40, 50, sometimes 60 percent in that range of the money. But then when I started, it was like, okay, well, the business needs to make this much per month and I, as a family, want to try and bring in this much and just every six months, we've reevaluated. Could the business bring in a little bit more? And oh, I've just wow. tried to push my business just that little bit further to say, okay, well, if I need to bring in um, an extra $500 into our account every month, then my business needs to make an extra $1,000 a month. Okay, so how am I going to do that? And so then every six months, I would just reassess, well, how far could I push it? Mm. Um, And that's how I've done it to this point. And over time, I would love to get to the point where I'm at more like a full-time wage. Um, But at the moment, I'm I'm probably on a standard Australian part-time wage. But I'm only working part-time hours as well. Okay, gotcha. And that's a great, that's a great mindset, I think, Sarah, as far as we tend to think as web designers, I feel like we think about like gross income. So we think about, okay, yeah. ooh, I'm getting a $5,000 website job, yeah. 5,000 bucks. But know, right? you're not getting $5,000. No. <laughs> you, know, you might be getting 
maybe three grand, depending on how that all equals out. Yeah. And then if you're hiring out, of course, yeah. it's even going to be a little less. But again, and I think it goes our back clients to freedom. and our other people feel like, whoa, you're charging that much for a website? Like, you must be rolling in it. Yeah. And it's just not like that. Like, there are so many hours that I spend on non billable work mm -hmm. because it's admin type stuff. I don't make money for that. Um, I use an app called Timely App, which it's like in the back end of the computer and it tracks my time and then it attributes how much money is earned for oh, okay. the different time. So it shows me like how much time is spent for the week. So I have time goals for the week, which is 20 hours. And then I've got money goals for the week. But some of my work earns money and some of my work doesn't earn money. And so it's a balance of both trying to work out, can I only work 20 hours? Can I make myself work 20 hours? But then I want to make sure that I earn the right amount of money. Because a lot of my work, I don't know, sometimes even for maintenance clients, like it doesn't earn as much. Yeah. I charge my, I my, like people on a maintenance plan only pay me 80%. Yeah. They, don't, yeah. they get a 20% discount. So obviously that money, that time doesn't make as much money are as you, other time. Are you billing out hourly a lot then, Sarah? Or are you doing fixed uh, projects? Uh, well, the web projects are fixed. So like if, yeah, a new website or a logo or a whatever, that's fixed. But then maintenance work is they pay an annual fee. They get two hours worth of maintenance support within that. Then once they've used that up, then they can purchase like two or three hours of maintenance support time, but they get that at a discounted rate. Okay. Um, and so that work is more hourly. And some clients want lots of things done and they don't care paying hourly and then some clients don't. And I think I never account for the fact that I need to get a lot more maintenance work done. Yeah. Like I always think about the big projects and how to... Um, schedule that into my life uh -huh. and I always forget the maintenance stuff and some of my clients like they just have a lot of things and they're yeah. really nitpicky well and that's and it takes so much longer than I expect I know you and I were chatting on a Divi chat about how you get some of those big fish projects where it's like okay you know like I've had a couple recently that are in the 15 to 20 thousand dollar range which is a huge yeah. step up from my average is generally between 2,500 and five around that yeah, range okay. So we're yeah. talking like two to three times or more generally. Yeah. Now, the only thing about that is, of course, it's going to be, you know, I'm going to be earning my bucks if I get those, of yeah. course. But one thing we I've been thinking about with this series is, okay, once that, you know, if it takes me three months to get a $15,000 job done, that's only yeah. one maintenance plan if they sign on. Whereas what yeah. if I got five $3,000 jobs done in those three months. Mm -hmm. That's potentially five recurring plans. So there's a lot yep. to think about that, you know, as far and as And the other thing up. is that those, like what I'm finding is the big fish are way more picky and mm -hmm. they're way more, like I've got about three or four, ten to $15,000 jobs and all of them have overstretched the budget. Yeah. Like, you know, like I have quoted based on hours. So maybe I've quoted um, 10 like 100 hours for a job and it's pushed to like 150. Like I have blown the budget in terms of time mm. on those jobs time and time and time again. And then they're the ones who want to nitpick like every little like millimeter of every, you know, and then they will look on every single device and then oh, they will like yeah. sight speed test or, you know, like. And you're probably getting just, quite a few cooks in the kitchen too, right? Like I know it yeah, always starts totally. out with one person and then next thing you know, there's like three new people and it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. well, I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. And so I think sometimes the small businesses who are willing to pay 5000 and for that, them that might even be a stretch, mm -hmm. like, but they feel really appreciative and then they see the business coming in, you know, like you start seeing the forms come through. Like I did a mechanic site and I constantly see these forms just oh, pass through my awesome. email of like, I want to get my car serviced and you know it means a lot to them. Yeah. Whereas these big places, I don't know, I'm just not sure they appreciate it yeah. as much. I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. And there is something that's so gratifying about working with like local small businesses. And yeah. in particular, if you see them grow and you see their traffic yeah. boost Well, you just it. see their ranking, like yeah. their ranking go from like page 54 to like even page two is mm -hmm. a win kind of thing. Or if they manage to get on page one and right. I don't know, I just, I think there's something about that, that it still has my heart a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a tricky one, but then yeah. at the same time, sometimes those big fish, you know, that you've got income for three months. So, <sighs> well, and that it's was my, ne my next question was going to be, are you changing your clientele, your ideal demographic, or are you going to try to make it work with that, those small to medium sized businesses? 
in and be I, able I'll to never know. I'll never go ginormous like I'll never go to government level or um, you know where you have to put in tenders and those type of things yeah. um, but I'm pretty flexible between the two so I'm I'm about to start a big job so I'm about to start a fifteen thousand dollar job for um, it's like a big festival truffle festival do oh, you guys wow. have truffles there anyway so they need like it to be super mobile friendly and almost app like and um, so that'll be a really interesting job and I'm really excited about it because I think for the big jobs, I want it to be worthwhile. I want to yeah. know it's going to look awesome on my portfolio. It's going to give me a little bit more profile raising just amongst people because it's local, it's in Canberra. Mm-hmm. Um, but then if something comes along and it's like a little job for a small business, like I'll lap that stuff up and I know I can fit that in between. So. I don't even mind the idea of having like a big job going alongside a couple of little ones yep. speckled in through it, I think is more manageable. I could never manage two big ones at the same time, mm-hmm. I don't think. That's my so, same mindset too. You know, is, and that's kind of one reason I'm trying to scale and take to the next level is I want to maintain, I'll probably raise my rates a little bit from where I'm at right now. Like I'll probably just increase my bottom line. But yeah. I definitely don't want to lose those small and medium sized businesses. There are some where it's like, okay, if you want to spend three, if you want to spend 300 bucks for a website, go to Wix or talk to a college student or something like it's just not going to happen. But for the majority of small to medium sized businesses who can do maybe two, three, four grand, I definitely want to maintain those and I want to keep them profitable. But one reason I want to scale is I want to be able to take on the every once in a while, 15 to 20. If yeah. like you said, maybe have one of those and a few smaller size, then, yeah. then shoot, you know, maybe your time is shoot. Even if you were to hire more subcontractors for the big one to take care of yeah. the systematized stuff. And then you do, yeah. you know, some of the more local, I think that sounds great. That's kind of yeah. what I'm hoping for with this as well is to, to be able to maintain that and manage that. Cause you get to a point, I meant to kind of say this earlier as far as like why you want to scale. It sounds like you are in a similar situation where I have been in the past about a year. It's like, I, I enjoy working by myself. I, I really love teamwork as well though. And I'm interested in helping more people out and building a team, but it just gets to the point where I, I couldn't stay just working by myself, even if I wanted to, unless I just yeah. turn work away, which is yeah. a really slippery slope because I don't know if word would spread around town per se, like hey, here, Josh isn't taking on work. He's getting too busy. But that does affect referrals, no doubt. If if some of your clients just say like, "Well, he's just too busy," you know, uh, eventually. Oh, some I don't that- know. Sometimes it's a good thing, like getting <laughs> to the point where you can start to turn away work you don't want to do. I yeah. think is a wonderful place to be That's in. That's a good point. I remember yeah. the beginning where I had to take on everything, no matter what came my way. Like I would just have to say yes to everything, and mm-hmm. it feels like a really luxurious place to be. And I think that's the hesitancy with growing is you're gonna have to take yourself back a little bit to the place of just accepting everything for a little while until you build back up. Um, but there, there is a luxurious place of being able to say. Well, I think clients respect when yeah. they hear you say, I'm two months booked out. Like, mm. it's, an, it's, it's a nice place to be. So I agree um, that you don't want to just I be guess turning everything away. But. I should have prefaced that. I'm thinking more about my, because I'm in a networking group and that's where the majority yeah. of my business leads come from. And yeah, I guess okay. I was thinking more of, of that scenario to where, yeah, like, if, okay. if the networking group find out that I'm too busy, that could potentially hurt yeah. leads because they wouldn't want yeah. to refer somebody. But yeah, that's like you right. said, the average person, if it's you get a lead and it's like, okay. I could do this, but do I really want to? That is a very yeah. empowering feeling. And, and will I want to put it on my portfolio or not? Yes. Like being yes. able to say no to the stuff you don't want on your portfolio, that's a, a really powerful position to that's be in. That's a great point. That's a, I think that's just a good rule of thumb. And I've kind of lived by that the past about year or so is if I'm not comfortable with putting this on my portfolio and if it's not really going to pay that well, then yeah, I, I'm going to try to refer it yeah. on or or not take it on. Or in some cases, if it's a client where I'm like, okay, I don't love their personality. They might be tricky to work with. Let's see if we yeah. can smoke them out, you know, weed them out. That way, if, yeah. if I get them for a couple extra grand, it'll be worth, yeah, you great. know, some extra emails or something. But Yeah, they get the like annoying fee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the annoying fee. Yeah. fee or the, I really don't want to show anybody this website fee. Yes, uh, yeah. The, <laughs> uh, the texting me at 2.30 on a Friday night yeah. fee. Yes, that's yeah. uh, that should be true. So the, sure. the other goal for me is that I really like working for charities. So mm. I spent 10 years working for a charity before I moved back home to Canberra. Um, and we had a website in that charity and it was a terrible website and we really wanted to improve it, but we had no money and we had no skill and we tried really hard and we were working in Joomla and it was just horrible. Um, So I used to do graphic design for that company um, 
when I was there. So one of my motivations is I really want to be able to help the charities who have no money, but they deserve to have the promotion. Like yeah. what this company used to do was fabulous, and but they had no good promotion going on. And so I wanted to be able to be a part of that, and I couldn't. Um, so now part of my motivation is that um, I can give away some of my time to be able to help the charities. And what I've learned is you can't give it away for free. They need to pay something because they don't – value it if they don't pay mm. anything um and so i just discount rather than giving it completely for free but not because i wouldn't be willing but because they don't appreciate it if they don't pay anything yeah yeah like, I, I making did. it affordable for them is is wonderful sure. like it is such a lovely thing to yeah, be able to a be a part win. yeah yeah and i know i did one last year for a non-profit here locally and what i did was i offered to do the site and then if they would just do the basic uh, monthly maintenance plan that way yeah, they're still on yep. their maintenance plan but they got a free site out of it so yeah nice. yeah, yeah yeah definitely tread lightly on on the uh foundation you know the, the free work or, or really discounted work yeah. for people for sure because well, the be other way bit. i just did another one and the way i got around it was i just used one of elegant themes as free templates mm. so um just to make it quicker because i knew it was a really basic one they didn't have big demands i said okay well i can reduce the price to this affordable price but it won't be custom it i will not give you multiple options to choose from and i basically just used a template i knocked it off in two days nice. i still actually got a decent pay out of it but they felt like they got a really big discount and then um i'm paying the hosting for them yeah pra- to to them. yeah right right well practically sarah are you are do you custom build pretty much each site or do you yeah. okay yeah because i don't use any templates and i don't use any child, child themes. themes yeah, yeah um so everything is custom designed and every client gets two or three home pages to choose from so they'll be completely separately designed using illustrator or i used to use uh ah, i've forgotten what it's called now um adobe xd experience design oh okay um but sophie likes illustrator yeah. so yeah we give them like two or three home page designs and then they can pick from that and then I'll custom build from that and the advantage is I know what we can pull off but it also pushes me to do something that I don't know if I can pull it off and I really like that I like the challenge and the last time that Sophie did a design for me like there was a couple of things and I was like I don't I have no idea how I'm going to pull this off but I'm really I'm like excited for the challenge and so it was awesome because it made me like pull out new CSS and well of course the the big question is will it work on Internet Explorer well Uh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So my big client that I had recently that was a pain in the ass, their company only used the new one, whatever it is. Is it Microsoft Edge? They use that. And it yeah, was yeah. a pain. It didn't do any gradients and it like it was just it was an absolute nightmare. But anyway. Yeah, I, I did just, <gasps> yeah, the, the lead I got today was a real estate group that mostly does farmland commercial real estate. And so their average <laughs> client is, is between fifty and sixty. So I yeah. intentionally, and it's a big, it would be a big job. So I'm intentionally yeah. going to do a quote knowing that, okay, I'm not going to get crazy with design. We're talking yeah. basic padding, no negative yeah. margins, no, uh, yeah. no, yeah, no <laughs> exciting stuff there, keeping it very simple. Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually thinking for one thing I'm going to start doing as I scale is because I want to maintain those small to medium sized businesses that I love working with so much is yeah. I'm going to offer those more custom solutions at a higher price range, but if somebody can't do that, say I do a proposal for 7,500, yeah. they're like, listen, we just can't do that, but they could do three. What I'm yeah. going to do is I'm going to try to have kind of a catalog of child themes, but yeah. I won't tell them it's a child theme because nobody knows yeah. what that means. I'm going to tell them, you know, we do have some templatized os- options yeah. where they could pick that layout. And then, of course, we would just change content, images, and some colors. Yeah. That's good. Which- I had that plan um, last summer. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to like make up three or four and I'm just going to have them there and I can do them on a lower budget. The next time I don't have work, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> and then I never had no work I know, and I haven't yeah. got around to it. But I think it's a really good idea. What? I definitely think it's a really good idea for the yeah. people who can't afford it or for charities or for people who just don't care. Like honestly, some clients, they don't care about a custom site. They just want a nice looking site. Yep. And if they don't care about custom, then, you know. 
Yeah, and I, I have thought about doing that as a plan B and not even putting that on the front end of my side because oh, yeah. the vice versa is I don't want a client to you know see those templates and then they get a quote for 7,500. Yeah. Then they're like, well, why is that 7,500 when this one's 2,000, yeah. you know? No, I would never put it on my website. I would definitely yeah. have that hidden, but it's a really good way to have an option or even like to be able to use it for someone who isn't willing to go higher, but you don't have to tell them it's a template right. necessarily, you know, right. like that kind of middle ground. Because you're still going to customize it. Any template never stays yes. as the template was, realistically. Yes. And that's partly why I haven't used child themes to the most part is because even when a client says they like the look of something, it never stays it never, that way yep. once you put the content in it. And yep. so then it becomes a custom site anyway. And you almost end up spending more time than if you had have just copied like a design. Yep. So in some ways, building off a design has made a more speedy process yeah because you have to relearn it's almost like in the old days of getting wordpress themes when you had to ho- learn a whole theme it's and that's kind of my, yeah. been my thing with child themes now i understand the value of them and i'm working on a couple myself mm. but i think it's a little bit different for designers like you and i who are more comfortable yeah. with divi where it is it's almost yeah. just faster just to design it from the ground up as opposed yeah. to learning somebody else's code and when i out first what thing came is. into wordpress i was definitely using templates and i definitely would have been all over child themes like a hundred percent it's just that I happened to come into Divi at the time when I was really expanding my CSS. And yeah. I think because of that, going back to a child theme, I mean, I would still do it like for a charity or whatever, but yeah, yeah. it just ends up, especially like using the free elegant themes template, it was great, but all of the CSS is like <laughs> right. embedded into the the functions, like all the, which oh, is great. Yeah. And, awesome for a newbie right but like to change one thing across the whole site was such a pain in the butt yeah so you know it's got its advantages and it was still quicker than custom building it for that job but at the same time like you've got to pick and choose when you use those i mm-hmm. think yeah and that all plays a, a big part in what we're talking about with scaling is because you really got to have your your processes and your systems down in place and the tools you use which is one thing yeah. that's so cool about wordpress and divi is like i i feel like right now I have such a solid foundation of the tools. I love Gravity Forms. I love Divi. I love WordPress. I love a few other plugins yeah. that I've been using. And now I finally feel like I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, I've got my toolbox. Now we're ready to, to take this to the next level and do tutorial videos yeah. on everything and all that. Yeah, nice. But yeah, I totally, so Gravity totally Forms, echo. a yeah. little side note here, Gravity Forms. Are you, have you been tempted by um, what's the other form builder? Oh, uh, um, Oh, oh I just blanked. Les- Leslie uses it, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, those ones. Have you been tempted by that? I haven't even looked at it, to be honest with you. Um, they, they, I've used it on a couple of people now who don't have the money to go with Gravity Forms or mm-hmm. who I'm not going to keep in my maintenance because if they're not staying in my maintenance, I can't put them on Gravity mm-hmm. because then they're going to have to pay for their own Gravity license. Um, but... No, yeah, I have an I unlimited like license more. with Gravity. I just yeah, yeah, me too. Okay. But I don't give that to someone who's not staying on my oh, maintenance. Oh, gotcha, plan. gotcha. Because I don't, I don't want them to. I don't know. I figure if then that's part of being on maintenance with me is you get to get your the license, premium your tool. plugins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like the other company, I feel like I should know what it is. Um, the other company, they they feel I feel like they're advancing more. I feel like more and more Gravity is not pushing forward and staying up to date and I'm feeling concerned that all my websites use gravity Yeah. and what's going to happen if I'm going to have to rebuild every single form if I need to move away from gravity at some point. It's making me concerned. I, 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 I'm, I share those sentiments, Sarah, for sure, because I've thought about that too. It does seem like they're lagging a little bit, particularly from like a design yeah. standpoint. Yeah. But yeah, it does make, it makes me concerned and I guess there is a point in there about the plugins that we choose to use, like I always use paid stuff because I feel like I can trust the company for a longer term. So yeah. people who are always using free stuff, like, yeah, maybe it's a little bit cheaper for, for you annually, but on the long run, what happens if that company disappears? What happens if they yes. completely go under? Whereas I feel like even someone like Gravity, although I've got my concerns at the moment, I feel like they're a pretty solid company. They're pretty well, I would think, the number one trusted form builder and I had some security questions which they answered for me like I felt really comfortable with them Um, but there's still that question that we are relying our business on Divi Mm -hmm. which I feel pretty confident in but you know they're doing a lot of changes really quickly all the time and so 
we're, we're putting all of our eggs into a divvy basket. We're putting them into gravity forms. If gra- gravity forms disappeared like tomorrow, Oof. I have to go to every single maintenance site and rebuild every single form and I'd restyle right, it. To I'd be right that there with you. Website. Yep. Yeah, you know, like, and that's I didn't know we haven't talked about that with anyone, but that's a great point when it comes to scaling is because yeah, you need to be careful about those tools. And I mm-hmm. I'm always leery about getting a cheap or free plugin to use on a site just because like I don't yeah. know how this is going to react. I hope it goes well, but yeah. but yeah, that's where you know developing. I that had a tool nightmare was, with a um like a, a sh- online shop website, so it was done with WooCommerce. But to do what we needed to do, we had to use quite a few. Um, plugins like they needed to use this one called drop shippers and the the ones that were offered through WooCommerce were not available like they didn't work they they didn't function so we had to use this one through Envato Market and when the big Woo update came recently they weren't ready and it completely stuffed the website and it took me three different times to update Woo successfully and Mm. it was just a nightmare we had custom code in there like it was just it was yep. a really big deal. And so all of a sudden, this person who was on this maintenance plan, their maintenance plan didn't cover anywhere near yes. the cost of time that it spent me to upgrade Woo. Like and it's it tough to go to the client and be like, hey, one of hours. our tools broke and I need to charge you three extra hours. If they're already paying monthly or yearly, that's a really tough yeah. thing to mention, you know? Well, I can't. Like, I can't yeah. because in my plan, the deal is I will update your website. I'll, like, I'll keep all the plugins up to date. And if anything breaks due to that, then I will fix it. Yeah. Like, so that it's my job. That's part of the security is that they don't feel like, you know, if I do a Divi update and it breaks the padding, they're not paying for my time to fix that padding because right. that's part of the plan that they're paying for. But yep. I have realized that I'm going to have to build in if someone has custom code that it may break and that may be additional time and that it's not going to be my expense, yeah. but yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a really tricky one. I'm right there with you. And usually I just kind of hope it evens out, you know, I mean, j- luckily I don't have that stuff happen too often, but it, when it does, I used to really stress me out, but now I'm like, okay, it's, it just kind of comes with it, you know? Yeah. And I put myself in their shoes. If I was paying a website designer 59 bucks a month, which is my plan right now, what yeah. would I expect? You know, if I saw yeah. that my padding was off, would I want to pay an extra hourly rate? No, to them? no, no. I would be like, can't you just, you know, I, so I, I definitely try to have that mindset as well. And it sounds like you yeah. do too. And I think and that's. And some clients have easier websites and mm-hmm. you do almost nothing on them. And so, you know, you make a ton of money from those websites and then maybe you make nothing from the other ones and somehow right. it evens itself out. Right, right. Um, in the long run. But yeah, I, I have wondered if I need to increase my plans for some of the bigger fish who have more custom stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sarah, this has been awesome. I've really enjoyed talking with you about, you know, your story and where you're at and kind of, you know, where you're headed and and a lot of lessons learned. I think we've talked about some really good practical stuff that particularly a lot of people who are in our situation where they maybe have a have a business where you found out just like I found out that when you start a website design business as a freelancer, if you do good work and you do it on time and you communicate well, and you have a good relationship with clients, you will stay busy. There may be periods where there's like a lot of work and a little bit less work, but very rarely will you ever get to a point where it's like, well, I've got nothing to do. Because if you ever get to that point, then you can finally work on your site. Um, Yeah. So I think we've But at the same time, I think you need to allow time for that. Like Mm -hmm. a lot of newbies will come in and in the first year say, I don't have any work. And like they see us busy and say, why aren't I as busy as you? Well, it, I reckon it took me three years until mm. I got to the point where I didn't have to look for work. And that was re- three years of really hard pushing, yeah. like working really hard and not always getting paid as well as I would like to have got paid Yeah. and building a portfolio. So yeah, just it does. like if you're in the early stages, <laughs> don't give up and don't feel like everyone else has it easy because it was bloody hard yeah. like I worked really hard in those first few years to get to this point yeah that's a great point and I probably should have prefaced that by saying in time if you do yeah. those three things eventually you'll yeah. get to a point where it's like definitely you're managing 20 some projects and then you just can't do it all by yourself because yeah it, do, it does take that time persistence everything that we've talked yeah. about before in Divi chat and stuff like that and you get to that point and the reason I say that is it's just it's kind of cool because we're both at the point right now where it sounds like we do what we did before. We either raise our rates or we start saying no to more projects or we get some help yep. and we take it to the next level, which is pretty cool. So, well, this has been yep. awesome, Sarah. I was really hoping to see a kangaroo drop by, but I haven't seen any. <laughs> Sorry. You got me all They're excited. They were hiding or sleeping or something today. <laughs> well, uh, before I let you go here, do you have any parting thoughts to anyone who is thinking about taking that next level, that next step? 
Uh, the only parting thought I would have is that if you are thinking about taking someone on, be cautious, take it slowly. I know some other people will probably say, like, just go in there and just like, but be cautious and think about your brand. I think it's really important to have the right person who is going to represent your brand well. If you're going to take on someone who is going to do any sort of visual things, um, the work that you put out is the work you're going to receive more mm-hmm. quotes for. And so it's really important that that is going to represent who you are as a brand, I think. Um, and like even someone who's going to come along and do coding for you, you want to make sure that they're going to do coding in a way that you can be proud of that. Um, so I would say really look into who you're going to bring in and see if it's possible for both of you to take it easily. Take it one job at a time. Don't sign yourself up for, you know, paying them $1,000 a month for a whole year. Yeah. Like. If it's possible, give it a go to just try it per job basis, see if it's working, review their work, make sure that you're happy, make sure they're happy um, and take it that way if you can afford to and if they're happy to. That's great insight, Sarah, because we've had quite a few that have said, be cautious, stay within your means. And like I said, vice versa, we've had a couple that's, yeah. you know, the more go-getters where it's like, what's the worst that could happen? David go Blackman for it. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, he's like, I'll oh, hire it out. It'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, but he nobody, said it to me a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, nobody has said be conscious, be conscious of your brand and how that affects that because that I didn't really think about that. But that for me, that's one of my biggest apprehensions about it is yeah. they are a reflection of me. And I've subcontracted before where they didn't meet the deadline, and there was a client that I've worked with for like four years, and this person did not represent me well. And I'm like, hey, sorry, you know, I just kind of let them know, like I tried to. Help, you know, get we some help, and it's just you know, and, and I had to make up for it. So yeah, that's. I don't know what happened, but I lost you. Sorry about that, Sarah. So yeah, I just had a quick uh, internet lapse there, but uh, oh, I think geez. we got your final thought in. But again, I don't know when I cut out, but just to reiterate, you're one of that was great insight that you said be be aware of your brand, be aware of how it's a reflection on you and hiring out because that is crucial. So yeah, great yeah, point. definitely, and I think it's a very scary thing because. As a sole freelancer in web design, you're getting work because of the type of work you're putting out. So you, you, whether you know it or not, you're creating a brand by the style that you continue to do. And I was very hesitant because I knew that my style was very clean and very simple. And that's very deliberate. I'm not trying to be basic. I'm trying to make my websites really functional and be really easy to use. Mm-hmm. Um, but that meant that I had to be really careful that I didn't get a designer who was going to want to clutter up my websites or it wasn't going to match yeah. my brand. Um, so I think it's a really important thing to be considering. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I don't mean to derail us, but you, you know, coming up with like a style guy or something like that is probably a good idea. Again, going back to the whole yeah. systematizing things before you bring somebody yeah, exactly. on. So. Sarah, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed talking with you, getting your experience and lessons learned. And like I said, what's been cool about this is having folks in your and I position where we're kind of on the lower level of just taking that next step all the way to people who are, managing 20 or 30 people, which I just, that stresses me out thinking about it. Personally, I don't know if I want to go to that that end. Yeah, not for me. I like building the website. I want to at least stay involved for the next couple of years if I can. Awesome. Well, we'll we'll definitely have to do this. I've got some other series in my my back pocket that I want to work on. So we'll definitely have to do another conversation like this soon. So and I'm excited. Maybe great. maybe by this time next year, you'll be running uh, Divi Chicks or whatever your business is. Yeah. Be for all. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, but this has been great, Sarah. Well, thanks so much for taking the time, and we'll be chatting here again soon. Sounds good. All right, thanks. Thanks.